All right, so welcome to our final webinar for 2021. Today we're going to be talking all things maple with Aaron Whiteman from the Cornell Maple Program. I'll let him introduce himself. My name is Steve Gabriel. I'm one of the co-chairs of the Agroforestry Program work team at Cornell. We do have a website that serves a bit as a gateway or a hub to all the agroforestry related activities happening within the Cornell community. And the easiest way to access that is either just uh, cornellagroforestry.org or you can just google Cornell agroforestry and you should be able to find it. This uh, website's hosted by the Cornell Small Farms Program, um, which is the entity I work for, which does a whole range of um, activities to support beginning and, and emerging farmers um, across a lot of different types of production. So agroforestry is just one of the projects that we're, we're focused on. So just a couple of things to mention on our website. One thing that I'm excited to announce um, and grateful for is the launch of a survey for folks who are in New York State working with lands in any capacity and interested in agroforestry in any capacity. Um, we have a survey open through the end of the year. And what we're looking to do is just collect some basic info to better inform our research um, and grant writing and fundraising efforts because um, we don't have a lot of good data about what's going on in New York and um, and the interest in where we can help support into the future. So it shouldn't take too long, 10 or 15 minutes to complete the survey. You can find that right at the top of the page. And if you have any for folks who uh, would also be willing to complete it, we'd love if you'd share, uh, share the link and get other folks to complete it as well. Uh, if you complete the survey before the end of the year, you will be entered in a raffle for <clears throat> a free maple syrup from the Cornell Maple Program. So pretty nice perk there if you can get it done between now and the end of the year. Um, our website is, a, a, like I say, a portal to all things agroforestry at Cornell. Uh, just below where the survey is, there is a sign up for our email list. This is really just a way that we can notify and announce to anyone. Um, anyone can sign up for the list, no matter where you are, and learn about upcoming programs and events that we may be offering or releases of new publications, things like that. So that's an easy way to sign up. We won't bug you too much, but just enough to keep you informed of our activities. And then as you scroll down, what you'll find is different section areas um, talking about agroforestry in the context of climate change, um, the indigenous uh, knowledge that is rooted um, in much of agroforestry practice, and then um, all of our webinars here that we've done over this past year. So the recordings are available here directly. We also have a um, playlist on our YouTube channel that you can find all of these if you want to check them out and go back and, and have a look at those. Um, and then finally, if you keep scrolling down, you'll get to these little buttons, these images, which highlight the main program areas or the main crops or um, systems that we're working with uh, here at Cornell currently. And if you click on each of these, you'll go to a section where you'll find some of the highlights and often it'll link you to another website or if, if there's a main project such as the Maple Program, uh, where we're just kind of connecting you to that, to that main site. So again, that's all at Cornell Agroforestry.org. And I'll just say once again, if you're in New York State, um, please do consider taking that survey and helping us out. I will put the link for folks who are live on the webinar in the box so you can click on it right there. So that's all I have. Um, without further ado, uh, I will pass it to Aaron and we'll hear about what the Mabel team's been up to here in this wild 2021. Thanks, Aaron. Thanks, Steve. And uh, thanks for highlighting all those great resources we have online. I would encourage you to check those out. These link to program websites. So for example, the maple syrup link goes to the cornellmaple.com website where we have a lot of free downloadable guidebooks and calculators and other useful tools. So definitely check those out. Um, I'm gonna start with a quick introduction then I'll share my screen here and we'll, we'll head into some topics. I will say maple is a, an endeavor that um, requires knowledge and understanding of a huge number of different topics, right? Because we're plumbers in the woods sometimes if we have tubing systems, we have to understand tree physiology. And there are just a lot of things at play in making maple syrup. So if there are things that I'm not covering that really interest you, I'll try to leave plenty of time at the end for questions. So strongly encourage you to put your questions in the chat box and we'll leave time to address those. Uh, by way of introduction, I'm Aaron Whiteman. I'm the co-director of the Cornell Maple Program. I'm a lifelong maple producer myself. I have a family sugaring operation in Western New York that we've been running since, well, I've been involved in it since I was a young lad in the 70s, um, but it, it predates me, my <laughs> entry onto the earth. So my grandfather started the business way back when. Uh, at Cornell, I operate the Arnott Teaching and Research Forest uh, sugaring 
operation where we have 7,500 trees tapped. We have a brand new maple laboratory that has two CERP production systems. Uh, we have an agroforestry demonstration plot. We have a research kitchen and we have a lot going on there. Uh, my colleague and maple program co-director Adam Wild runs the E-Line Research Forest in Lake Placid, New York, where we have another about 7,000 trees tapped and have a commercial kitchen and a good processing facility there as well. Um, so we're probably one of the largest, if not the largest maple syrup research outfits in the United States. We cover a lot of topics. And as I said before, a lot of our work is encapsulated in the resources available at cornellmaple.com. And with that, I will go ahead and share my screen. And I see that Windows updated last night. So let's see if I can figure out the right way to show my slides now. There we go. All right, so I hope you can all see that. And we'll go ahead and get started. And the first thing I'd like to do is thank our sponsors. The Cornell Maple Program is a grant funded organization primarily. And most of that funding comes from the USDA in various forms and also New York State Department of Agriculture and Markets. And last but not least, the Department of Natural Resources and the Environment at Cornell University. We are a research unit within that department at Cornell in the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences. So we're grateful to our supporters. Now, the first thing I wanted to talk about today was tubing research. Now, a lot of folks that get into maple syrup production start with buckets, which is great. Um, but buckets do have limitations. They require a lot of labor. Um, and it's certainly more efficient in some instances to move to a tubing system. So that is the way most maple operations evolve is start out with a few buckets in the woods and then move to a tubing system, then eventually maybe add a mechanical vacuum to that system. And at the Arnott Forest, we do have a vacuum tubing system. All of our trees are attached to vacuum pumps so that we're getting maximum yield. But the very first and most important thing to understand when you install a tubing system, or even if you're just working with buckets, is why and how sap flows in a maple tree, right? So maple trees actually develop positive pressure during the sugaring season. So they go through these freeze-thaw cycles where the freeze creates a vacuum inside the tree and warm weather creates positive pressure inside the tree. And that positive pressure is what makes sap flow when we drill a hole into the tree or tap the tree, right? If there was no pressure, no sap would come out. And maple trees are storing sap, you know, they're storing carbohydrates for uh, several main reasons. But um, the important thing is to know that sugar maple trees are converting some other energy reserves into sugars. Those sugars are present in the sap during the dormant season. And that when the tree pressurizes during a warm cycle, those sugar laden saps can be harvested. One easy way to see this for yourself if you're interested, or as I have illustrated here, um, to understand in internal tree pressure is to just tap a vacuum pressure gauge into a tree. And so what you're seeing here is where I've taken a standard um, plastic spile or spout that's used to tap maple trees. I've attached a little bit of tubing and some conversion fittings onto that so that I could hook it to a vacuum pressure gauge. So if you look at this gauge, uh, there's a zero at the about the 11 o'clock position. Everything counterclockwise to the six o'clock position is showing vacuum measured in inches of mercury. And everything clockwise to the six o'clock position is measuring PSI, uh, pounds per square inch of pressure inside the tree. And what we're seeing here in this tree is a tree that is, was frozen the previous night and then it warmed up, thawed out, and it's above freezing now. And it has 25 PSI of pressure inside the stem of that tree. That's a tremendous amount of pressure, right? You could blow up a, a car tire with that amount of pressure. So it's significant. Um, the reason that sap doesn't come squirting out of the tap hole at that high pressure is just that the, the vessels that the sap passes through which are called the xylem or the vascular tissue inside the tree, 
is a very small opening. So it's a very small passage that the sap passes through. It's passing through cell membranes. So it's, it's slowed down by that, but there is a lot of pressure behind this process. On the other side of that, here we see a tree that's undergone a freeze. So it's frozen at this point and it has 10 inches of vacuum. Now, 10 inches is a lot of vacuum. Um, and what that does is it allows the tree to draw up additional water from the soil. So below the frozen layer of soil, the, the roots penetrate deep enough so that they're below the permafrost layer and they're able to grab moisture and pull it up into the stem. And this is an important cycle for maple syrup production because when we tap a tree, when, it, when it's under pressure, it drains the sap out of the stem. Eventually, if it stays warm long enough, the tree loses pressure and we drain all the excess sap out of the stem. So we need a recharge. So these freeze cycles are important to recharging the sap in the stem and keeping the sap flowing and keeping our maple seasons productive. Now, another way to look at this uh, is with a time-lapse video. And this is really illustrative of how this works. So what we have here in this video, and it's a little bit hard to see, uh, but I'll point out the things that are important to see. In that digital um, gauge that's hanging from the tree, it's got the time in, in the biggest font. And in the bottom left corner is the temperature. And here we're seeing the temperature at 29.3 degrees Fahrenheit. The gauge that's tapped into the tree is similar to the gauges that you saw in the last few slides, except that in this gauge, the zero point is right at the 12 o'clock position. Everything counterclockwise to 12 o'clock between 12 and six is vacuum and everything in the clockwise direction is pressure and PSI. So right now what we're seeing is a tree that's frozen and it's at about five inches of vacuum. So I'm gonna start this video and when I do pay attention to the temperature in the bottom left corner of that digital gauge. And when you see the temperature go above freezing, uh, move your eyes toward the gauge and watch it change. It's pretty dramatic. And here we go, I'm gonna start the video. Okay, we're above freezing. Now watch that gauge. Now hopefully you saw that really dramatic swing in the positive direction. Right, so as time goes on, see we're up to getting close to 50 degrees. Having a pretty good sap run this day. As the tree uh, presses out that sap through a tubing system, the pressure drops. Now we're below freezing. Now watch the gauge, boom. Swings really rapidly in a, within about 20 minutes into the freezing range. So now that tree is in vacuum mode. It's recharging the sap and the stem. Pressure is drifting downward a little bit. That might just simply be due to a little bit of a micro leak around our gauge. And we're getting toward dawn. Now we're going to start warming up. And you'll see there's a bit of a delay between above freezing. So we're above freezing. And there's a bit of a delay. And now, boom, we swing, swing back into positive pressure. And we have a really strong sap flow event this day. You can see how high the pressure got up to about 15 PSI. So anyway, that's the basic cycle that's giving us sap production during the sugaring season. And this is a fun video to watch. I'll just let it play out for one more quick cycle here. So you can see the tree just went into vacuum mode. <clears throat> and frozen through the night, another nice solid freeze down into the mid twenties. That's a good temperature for sap production because we're not so cold that we're freezing the tree 100% solid. So it will thaw quicker in the morning, but we're getting enough of a freeze to create a vacuum. Now we're gonna go back into thaw, above freezing. I think the video stopped before we went positive again, but the tree goes back into positive pressure and the sap flows again. Okay. I'm gonna pause real quickly to look at the chat box. I see some things popped up. Okay, great, We yeah, the recording. As Tracy points out, is available online. Oh, this is for the, the class. 
And I believe at one point we had this video posted online at cornellmaple.com. And if we don't, I'll try to get it back up online because it's fun to see. So why is that important? What are the implications for sap collection beyond just the fact that when we have vacuum and pressure cycles, we can collect sap? Well, as you can imagine, if we have a tubing system attached to the tap hole, when the, sap, when the tree is in positive pressure mode, it's pushing sap out into the tubing so that we can collect the sap. But what happens when the tree goes into vacuum mode? Well, that same sap is going to get sucked back into the tap hole and into the tree, right? That's a tremendous amount of vacuum, so it's going to pull that sap back pretty hard. The problem is that tubing systems are contaminated with microbes. It's inevitable, even though they're closed systems, and even if we clean them, there's enough, uh, enough microbes in the atmosphere that they get into the tubing systems and they start to proliferate, right? They, they regenerate in the tubing system. So we're, by microbes, I mean primarily yeast and bacteria. When the sap gets sucked back into the tap hole, those bacteria and yeast go with it. And they do two things in the tap hole. Well, three things really. Uh, one is just physically their bodies, even if they're dead, the bacterial and yeast bodies can block the vascular tissue or what the sap flows through and they can reduce sap flow that way. The bacteria and yeast can also proliferate in there so they can regenerate, reproduce, and cause more clogging of the tap hole in that regard. And last but not least, trees when they're tapped, even though it's during the dormant season in winter, they're never 100% dormant. There are still cellular processes occurring within the tree. And those include the tree's response to wounding. So trees, when they're wounded, they have an active, it's almost like their immune system, they have an active response mechanism where they start walling off the wounded area. So they, they basically harden all the cells around the wound and make them non-conductive to sap. And this is a way for the tree to protect itself from uh, rot, so fungus and things like that, and also other disease and other invaders. So it's a way for it to protect the wounded site. And bacteria and yeast can amplify that, that response. So when we have a tubing system and we're going through that freeze-thaw cycle, pressure vacuum cycle, we're sucking that sap back into the tap hole and we're, we're reducing the useful life of the tap hole and its productivity over time. And this is where tube cleaning is really important. A lot of people, when they first get into maple production and they get into installing a tubing system to collect their sap, think, oh my gosh, how am I gonna keep all this tubing clean from year to year? And they, they think about cleaning the whole thing with the idea that they wanna protect sap quality. They want clean sap coming out into their storage tanks. And while that's important, really the bigger implication of tubing uh, cleanliness is this impact that it has on tap hole productivity. So with that knowledge, we've engaged, and by we, I mean Cornell, University of Vermont, and others have engaged in researching tap hole sanitation or tap hole longevity treatments that try to prevent the bacteria from getting back into the tap hole and making it close off faster. And there are a number of different strategies that we've tested to accomplish this. We've tested mechanical interventions, right? So things that physically block the sap from going back into the tap hole. We've tested antimicrobial materials. So fittings or tubing parts that actually kill the microbes before they get back into the tap hole. We've tested sanitation. So these are chemical sanitizers that are used to clean the tubing. And last but not least, you can actually just replace the tubing from year to year or parts of it to keep it clean. And all these strategies, all four, have varying degrees of effectiveness, but they can all help improve the productivity and the lifespan of a tap hole. So let's 
look at the how we test that and what we found. So we test this pretty closely and we continue this research. Uh, this research started in earnest in about 2004 and it continues to this day. And each year I test about 12 to 15 different treatments in the woods at the Arnott Forest. Um, Adam Wild, my, my colleague in the Adirondacks does a similar number of tests at the Eline Maple Research Forest and research at the, researchers at the University of Vermont Proctor Maple Research Station do these tests as well. And the way they're structured is, first of all, we have to establish some controls, right? We need something to compare our treatments against. And for these type of experiments, it's good to have two controls. The first control is kind of a lower level control. It's a worst case scenario. And what that is, is where we take old tubing, so tubing that's been used year after year in the woods to tap trees, and terminology wise, you'll see that it says drops and spouts. So in a tubing system, um, the tubing runs out to the trees and there's a T fitting in the tubing and attached to that T fitting is a drop line or a little 30 inch section of tubing with a spout on the end so that each individual tree can be connected into the tubing, right? So that's the drop line. It's that last little segment that connects from the T into the tap hole of the tree. So in our control, our lower level control, we have old tubing that's dirty, hasn't been cleaned, and then that drop line and spout, so the part that gets hammered into the tree, those have no cleaning either. So we're taking old tubing, old spouts, and just drilling a hole into the tree and tapping that into the tree. So that's the worst case scenario because it's going to have a lot of microbes built up in the system that are then going to get sucked into the tap hole and cause the tap hole to be less productive and close off sooner in the season. At the opposite end of the spectrum, what we have is an all new tubing system that we install every year. So we do a treatment where we install all new tubing. Um, we replicate that four times. So we'll have four treatments that have all new tubing, four trees on each treatment. And that represents like the ideal scenario, best case scenario, right? So we have a range there that we can compare our experimental treatments against. And then we do our experiments. Uh, we do different treatments to try to en enhance tap hole longevity. And all these are in the same woods. Every treatment, we, we replicate it four times. So for example, if we're testing check valve spouts, we have four lateral lines where all the trees have check valve spouts and each line has four trees on it. So each treatment has about 16 trees and they're spread out throughout our sugar bush and the trees are about the same, um, the conditions are about the same. So this isn't 100% exact, like a lot of in woods experiments, um, but because we do this year after year, we have a pretty good idea of what the data mean. What this looks like in the woods is each experimental treatment, you can see the tubing coming in here from the left and this, um, it hooks to a collection canister. So these big blue canisters are vacuum, vacuum resistant collection canisters. So instead of flowing into our mainline collection system, which is these black tubes up here, um, the sap flows into these blue canisters. And these blue canisters are then connected to the black mainline in order to conduct vacuum through the system. So these trees are on vacuum. Every time the sap flows, we go out in the woods and we measure the volume of sap in these, in these canisters. And for some research treatments, we also measure the sugar content, every sap flow. Between the Arnott Forest near Ithaca and the Eline Forest in Lake Placid, we have about 200 of these canisters in the woods. So we are gathering a significant amount of data. Now, the second thing to keep in mind here is that there are different types of tubing. The traditional tubing that most maple producers have used going way back into the 1950s is 5 16 tubing. So the inside diameter of that tubing is 5 16 of an inch. Now, more recently, about 10 years ago, I believe, uh, researchers at the University of Vermont developed a smaller diameter tubing. It's 3 16 of an inch on the inside. Now these 
two tubing types, even though they're, they're, they only differ in diameter size, have very different properties. The reason that 3 16 tubing was, was invented and is manufactured and used is that that really small diameter inside the tubing combined with the capillary action and the adhesive properties of water and sap makes the tubing fill up into a solid column inside of the tubing, right? So in 5 16 tubing, the sap oftentimes is just running along the bottom of the tubing. The sap doesn't fully fill up the tube. In 3 16 it fills the tube all the way. And what that does is when you install the tubing on a slope, is that solid column of liquid moving downhill pulled by gravity is like a head, a vacuum head. It creates a vacuum behind it. And if you have enough drop or enough slope in your line, you can actually generate really significant vacuum in your tubing. And for every foot of drop, you get about 0.88 inches of vacuum. So if you have 30 feet of drop in your line between a tap hole and the end of the 3 16 tubing line, you can actually get up to almost full vacuum. You can get up to 28 inches of vacuum in that line without any type of vacuum pump. That's important for a lot of maple producers because A, a lot of sugar bushes are far away from electricity where you can't hook up an electric vacuum pump. And B, vacuum pumps are really expensive. Commercial scale vacuum pumps, like the ones we use at the Arnott Forest, can run you anything, anywhere from seventeen dollars to $20,000. So that's a significant cost. Whereas you can get the same benefit from a cheap roll of tubing in certain situations, right? And that's why these two different types of tubing exist. So 5 16 is the traditional tubing that we've used for a long time. And 3 16 is this newer tubing. Now, going back to tap hole sanitation, we have a lot of experience with 5 16 tubing. And we know what works well for keeping that, produ that tubing productive over time and keeping those tap holes open for a long period of time. For 3 16 we have less information because we've just been working with it for less than a decade. And we're just figuring out the problems that it can have regarding tap hole longevity. So I'm gonna go through each of those. And we'll start with um, talking about sap suck back, right? And that's the phenomena that I just talked about where when trees go from their pressure mode and freeze and go into vacuum mode, they're sucking sap back through the tubing into the tap hole. For 5 16 tubing, that situation is fairly straightforward. Because the tubing diameter is larger, we found that the volume of sap that gets sucked back, it only comes from about 12 inches back in the tubing, right? So we go out and we measure this in experimental treatments where we plug tubing into the tree. We have it set up in a way that we can watch the sap flow back into the tree. We did this quite a few times and saw that the maximum amount, amount of sap pullback we saw was from 12 inches back in the tubing. And this vastly simplifies things, right? Because that means that the only part of the tubing we really have to worry about closely as far as controlling the bacteria and how it moves is the drop line, that part that connects from the T to the spout. Right? So that's a very limited amount of the tubing that we have to worry about. In 3 16 tubing, because the tubing is so much smaller, it pulls back from a longer distance through the tubing into the tree before it freezes or before it enters a, a, a state where it's not pulling sap back through the tubing anymore. So as much as 12 feet, and we've even seen it since I made this slide, um, we've actually witnessed 40 feet of pullback in some systems. Because if you put a lot of trees on the tubing, you can actually get greater pullback. So 5 16 tubing, the general recommendation is that you have five or six trees per line on that tubing. Some people go eight to 10, but for 3 16 tubing, you can put as many as 45 trees on one tubing line. So if you've got 45 trees pulling vacuum when they freeze, you're gonna get a much more significant amount of pullback of the sap. 
And the implication there is that just sanitizing the drop line or spout is going to be inadequate for addressing the sap pullback issue to keep your tap holes productive over the long term. So let's zoom in and look quickly at 5 16 tests so we can see what works. So you can see here we have studies going back to 2007, 2009. On the left hand side, we're looking at the gravity system. So this is tubing in the woods without any mechanical vacuum pump hooked to it. And it just relies on slope and gravity to get the sap from the tap hole down to the collection tank or the sugar house. And what we're seeing here with the percent numbers is the percent increase in sap yield over those lower level controls. So these were compared to old tubing where nothing was done to improve tap hole longevity over time. So just dirty old tubing. And in this experiment, the spout and the drop line were replaced. So brand new drop line, brand new spout on 5 16 tubing, just replacing that little 30 inch section and putting a new spout on it in the gravity systems gave about a 100% yield increase. So doubled the sap output in most of these seasons. And you'll see a similar result in vacuum systems. So even though there's a me mechanical vacuum on the system, the, the effect is essentially the same, about a 100% increase a lot of years. Overall, the average was about an 82% increase in sap yields by just replacing that spout and drop line. So we're talking about less than a dollar's worth of materials to double the amount of yield from a tap hole. So if you're increasing your yield from a pint of syrup to closer to a quart, uh, you're already talking about six or seven bucks there in gross profit. So this is something that easily pays for itself and generates additional revenue season to season. But walking out through the woods and replacing bits of tubing takes time. Right. So are there other methods that we could employ that either save time or save materials? So what have we done there? OK, one strategy is we've looked at bleaching. And I'll just jump ahead one slide. And what we mean by that is we add a quick connect. So that's what you're seeing here the, in the zoomed in picture. That's a quick connect fitting that you can buy at most maple product dealers. I think they cost 25 cents each. You can easily cut that into the line. and then when the season ends or typically um, in the summer or fall, you can go out into the woods, take that section of the line off, take it back to the workshop and submerge it in bleach. And for our bleach tests, we use 200 parts per million of bleach. So that's a tablespoon of bleach and a gallon of water. And it's important that it's unscented bleach with none of the uh, splash preventative additives or anything like that, so just plain chloride bleach, one tablespoon per gallon of water with 30 minutes of contact time. And it's not enough to just submerge that, the tubing in the uh, wash solution. You have to actually ensure that it gets some contact time. Um, and by that, I mean, you want it to actually flow into all parts of the tubing. So you have to slosh it around a little bit. Some people that use this method have actually built pumps or rotating drums that keep the wash uh, the wash solution circulating through the tubing. And then after it's bleached, it needs to be rinsed uh, with potable water. And then for this method, you really don't want to return those drop lines to the woods until right before the trees are tapped. Because if you go back out into the woods and snap them in place and they sit for months and months and months, they'll get recontaminated with bacteria and yeast. So typically they're rinsed, they're kept uh, stored someplace where they're dry and clean. And then at the sugaring season, at the commencement of the sugaring season, they're returned to the woods, tap the trees. And again, we see a really good result from this, uh, close to a doubling of yield and sap. And over the, the time period we've studied this, the average is about a 72% increase in sap production from that. And what that's doing is when the sap gets sucked back from that drop line, Again, it doesn't have the heavy bacteria and yeast load in it because we sanitized it. And so it doesn't contaminate the, set, the tap hole uh, to a high degree. Another option is the check valve spout. And I have one pictured here in the, the bottom right corner of the screen. And all the check valve is is a little rubber ball inside the spout. 
that when the tree goes into vacuum mode, that ball is sucked back tight against the aperture of the spout and it seals it off 100%. The sap can't get around that. So the sap that's contaminated with bacteria and yeast can't get back into the tree. Uh, this was invented by a team up at the University of Vermont. They're available through Leader Evaporator Company. I think they're about 75 cents a piece, or at least they were last season. They'll probably be more expensive just like everything else this year, but they're relatively inexpensive. And again, we see that almost doubling of sap yield, uh, on average 72% increase in yield over time. I wasn't involved with these tests, uh, but peroxide was tested. So peroxide is an oxidative sanitizer. So a peroxide molecule is H2O2. And that extra oxygen is unstable. It wants to break away from the peroxide. And when it does, it's going out on the hunt for electrons, right? And it's ripping them away from things like microbes. And that's what kills them, right? So it's a sanitizer in that regard. Um, there are other oxidative sanitizers out there. Um, and if there are any chemists in the audience, I, I apologize if I mangled that explanation, but I think it's generally right. Um, but in our tests, I think the, the concentration was fairly low and it didn't have a good result as you can see here, but there are some commercial oxidative sanitizers available now, like OxySan that are approved for tubing systems. And I think they would yield something similar to uh, bleach if they were tested and we just haven't tested those yet. But peroxide itself at an over-the-counter dilution rate doesn't seem to be very effective. Another innovation is uh, antimicrobial plastics. So this is similar to what's used in the medical industry where ionic silver is embedded into the plastic and it sanitizes in a similar way to the oxidative sanitizer, right? It, uh, it can steal electrons from the microbes. And in our tests, we, we saw some good results some years and not so good other years. And I think the jury's out on how well, at least this particular brand, it's called Zapback, how well they work. And it appears that maybe they don't sanitize to a high enough level to prevent a biofilm buildup inside of the spout but there's probably room for some improvement in the formulation. And I suspect that that formulation for the plastic itself will be tweaked over time and perhaps become more effective. Um, I think those are, those are the main sanitizing solutions that we're using right now. And what those look like when we graph out the results from year to year, this is an example. You can ignore the green bar on the top. That's where we added a second tap later in the season to test out um, the productive potential of adding another tap at the end of the year. But uh, the blue bars below it show new spouts and drops. So that would be our control in this, or no, we have an all new system down near the bottom. That's our upper level control. And then with the red bar, there's uh, old spouts and drops. That's our lower level control. And then the top two blue bars show the bleach and the new spouts and drops treatment. So you can see that we're basically getting the system back to a level where it's almost as good as new by doing these treatments. So does anyone have any questions about 5 16th tubing and how to keep it productive? We want to unmute or throw a chat question in the chat box. Okay, well, we can if someone's thinking of a question or formulating one and typing it, we can circle back to that later. And I'll, I'll check the chat box periodically. But 5 16th tubing, those are known practices and nearly everyone in the industry utilizes those practices now. Um, even just 10 years ago, that wasn't that common. But now nearly everyone does it. And that's one of the reasons that's actually behind the massive increase in production in the maple industry. If you're not aware of the state of the maple industry in the Northeast or in, the, in New York in particular, maple syrup production has increased about 400% in the past 15 years. And a big part of it had to do with these innovations in um, production technology, including tap hole sanitation. 3 16 however, is a different story. This 3 16 tubing is so intriguing and it has so much promise that a lot of people went out and grabbed a bunch of it and installed it in their woods and they expected to get better yields. 
right? And in the first year that those systems were in the woods, a lot of people did experience yield increases. What we have here is a comparison of 3 16th tubing productivity compared to 5 16th tubing in a controlled trial conducted by Adam Wild at the Eline Research Forest. The hashed uh, bar is showing the 3 16th tubing. The solid black bar is the 5 16th tubing. And on the far left, we are looking at the first year that it's in the woods. So all new tubing, all new 5 16th, and all new 3 16th. And this is not an atypical result in that the 3 16th tubing outperformed the 5 16th tubing. It generated more sap. Now, as you look to the right, over the next four seasons, you'll see that's not the case. The 3 16th tubing very quickly drops off in yield. And by the time it's three or four years old, we're seeing significant declines in production, 25 to 30%. Some maple producers all even see a 50% decline in production of their 3 sixteenths compared to their 5 sixteenths systems, right? So there's something very problematic occurring here. The first thing we looked at um, in, in a research capacity was the sap pullback issue, right? So we assume that part of the problem, at least, if not the whole problem, is that we're getting bacteria and yeast laden sap getting sucked back into the tap hole and diminishing productivity over time. And this is where, this is just a visualization of that test where we measured sap pullback and we found the 12 feet of pullback. And with that in mind, we adopted some strategies to try to prevent sap suck back into the tap hole. One of the things we did is we converted the drop line on 3 16 tubing. So that last little section from the T up to the tap hole, we converted that into a 5 16 line so that we would still get the natural vacuum benefits of the 3 16 tubing, but we would only get 12 inches of suck back in that last little bit of line where it goes to the tap hole. Thinking that this, if we put a brand new 5 16 drop line onto a 3 16 lateral line, or sap line, we would prevent that suck back into the tap hole. Another strategy was 3 16 silver spouts, so antimicrobial plastic spouts, thinking that might help prevent uh, contaminated sap from getting back into the tap hole. The last strategy we tried was check valves, both in the spout, like the picture I showed you before of the check valve spout, and also inline diaphragm style check valves. This is year one of that research. Uh, we weren't expecting to see any re revealing results in year one because we know that 3 16 tubing does just fine in its first year of production. But this is what those looked like in year one. Uh, the only real significant finding here was that putting two check valves in a line uh, was too much resistance and diminished sap productivity a little bit. And that's the, the bar graph with uh, 33 gallons of sap per tap. So we knew we couldn't double up on uh, check valves, but the results didn't really tell us anything this year. The real revealing results would come in the next year, right? So here are the 2018 results. And you don't need to pay any attention to all the hieroglyphs on the left-hand side. That's just our shorthand for notating the different treatments that we used. Um, this graph is showing how much more sap each treatment got beyond the worst case scenario of just all old 3 16 tubing. So down at the bottom, our old control system got 19.2 gallons of sap per tap. And then our upper level control at the top got 35.4 gallons of sap per tap. And you can see here that none of our treatments worked very well. And all these treatments should have worked just fine for preventing backflow from that back suck phenomena into the tap hole, but none of them worked. So clearly we're missing something here. Our strategies are failing somehow. In 2019, the following year, we tried testing these things again, but we, we had an unusual circumstance in that we had to do a timber harvest, a thinning experiment in our research sugar bush. And because we had large logging equipment coming into the woods and because we were removing some of the trees, we had to relocate our treatment lines. 
when you move a sap line, you can't just move it to a new set of trees because the drop lines where you have the, the T's and the drop lines that connected to the old trees, they don't line up with the new trees. You have to relocate them in the line. And to do that, we cut out the T fitting. We just chopped it out and put in a new T and moved our spout treatments to new trees. What we found at first were some really mixed results that confused us, but when we sorted our results in accordance with which trees had new T fittings on them, then we found a real difference. So what we're showing here in this graph is for each treatment, separating the results into trees that got new T fittings on their drop lines and those that didn't. So the new T fittings are the blue bars, the old T fittings are the red bars. And what this tells us is that old T's, so the T fittings, are the source of the trouble that we're seeing, right? In addition to the suck back, suck back effect, we're having some type of problem in the T's themselves. And this is just another chart showing how dramatic that difference was between new T's and old T's. And it, it, if you just look at the very first row, you'll see that the, the treatment where there were new T's, 41.5, gallons of sap per tap compared to 23.7 where there were old teas. So the teas are a really big controlling factor in this drop off and yield over time. So we went out in the woods and we, we harvested some of these teas and took a look at them. And in the picture on the left, you can see that there's a little bit of biofilm inside there, but you can see through the tubing just fine. So that seemed a little bit odd to us, right? There, didn't, there wasn't an obvious blockage and we cut maybe a hundred of these out of the woods and inspected them and didn't see any obvious blockage. What was revealing is if we took those same teas and we dropped them in a glass of water overnight, came back and checked them in the morning and that's what we saw in the right-hand picture was that biofilm, it was on the surface of the tubing, rehydrated and completely blocked the tubing. So that's the situation that was happening in the woods that was diminishing our sap flow, was that over time, in between seasons, a biofilm was building up in the tea fittings and creating this blockage. It's not a solid blockage, but it's enough that it creates really significant resistance and makes it hard for sap to flow through the line. So there's our problem, it's the teas. So what are we gonna do about it? Well, clearly we need some new strategies to address this. And this is what I've tested now for two years. So I'm at the beginning of these tests, but I have some interesting pre preliminary results. Now, one of the strategies I employed was antimicrobial 3 16 inch tees. Just bought these offline from US Plastics, an online dealer of all kinds of different plastic tubings and fittings. And those were medical grade and they utilized a silver ion for their antimicrobial properties. I also tried going up to a larger diameter T to create a bigger opening. And then I tried the larger diameter T's with antimicrobial plastics and um, also with a larger drop line. And last but not least, I tried sanitizing the T's in the woods with calcium bleach. So I switched from sodium bleach. So instead of sodium hypochlorite, I used uh, calcium hypochlorite. And I did that because the sodium in Regular bleach, if it's not completely rinsed out of the system, sometimes attracts rodents that chew the tubing to get to the salt. And calcium bleach doesn't have that problem. It's also relatively cheap. It's basically pool shock. It comes in powder form. You can get a huge amount of it for a small amount of money and it goes a long way in the woods. So that's what I tried that first season. These are what these fittings look like side by side. These alternative fittings, these are the T's. And that gives you an idea of what the difference is in the aperture, the opening size in quarter inch versus 3 16 inch. Right? We're only gaining a 16th of an inch in diameter, but it almost doubles the opening size. And the theory there is that even if there's a biofilm that builds up, it won't build up to the point where it's completely plugging the fitting. So that's what they look like in the woods. So in order to install these bigger, fittings into smaller diameter tubing. It was a bit of a fight. 
we had to invent a little expander tool, which wasn't too hard. It was just a little uh, double-ended bolt where we grounded a, ground down the ends to make a little bullet-shaped piece of metal that we could squeeze into the tubing to open the aperture a little bit more before we put in these fittings. And we tested these both in our replicated trials, but also on a commercial scale. So instead of just trying these on 16 trees each, we also took them out into the woods and put in 500 of each style of these tees just to get an idea of what it was like to work with those fittings in the woods and how they would perform on a commercial scale. Our 2020 results, again, this is the first year we're trying these things, so we didn't find a lot that year. Uh, the bleach treatment was the only one that we could really get a good sense of how well it was working. And it didn't work as well as we thought it would. Uh, I suspect that had to do with a little bit of the methodology uh, that was employed in the woods. But the real thing we're curious about was the second year and how those did in 2021. So you can see here we had fairly good results, not great results, but that was just one year. Um, we did encounter some problems in that first year that were informative. One was that those 3 16 smaller tees that weren't specifically made for maple were a little bit delicate, so they were hard to use in the woods. That could be resolved by a maple specific tee being manufactured. So that's not an insurmountable barrier. We did find that the quarter inch tees were quite difficult to install, took a lot of time. Some of them didn't hold up throughout the season. They popped apart or they leaked on our vacuum system. So quarter inch tees were a bit problematic. Uh, they gave my technical crew some major headaches working in the field for sure. Uh, the drawback we found with bleach is just that it takes time to inject. And I'll show you a little bit more about what the issues were with that in a moment. So I'll go through uh, our 2021 treatments, the, the results, and then I'll pause for questions. So those were our treatments in 2021 that I adopted. We basically put the same things in the woods, except that I bumped the bleach concentration up a little bit to see if that helped get a little better result. So how did we do? In this graph, the red bars represent our lower limit controls. So the far left, 21 gallons per tap was our old 3 16th system. I put 5 16th tubing in the mix as a comparison. So the second red bar is an old 5 16th. And then, then on the far right, those are all new controls, 3 16th and 5 16th, with 30 gallons per tap being our productivity from our all new 3 16th tubing. And you can see that most of our treatments did pretty well. Some actually exceeded production in our control system. And then there was one that didn't do so well. So let's look at those one by one. The 3 16th antimicrobial tea, and you can see an arrow indicating which one, which fitting that is down the bottom left corner, did really well. It actually outperformed the all new 3 16th system. Uh, and it was 57% uh, more sap than the old system. So really good result at a very minimal cost. These are 76 cents each. Now, the reason that I think it actually outperformed the all new system was just the nature of the sugaring season last year. The weather was unusually warm at the end of the season. So we had a long freeze, a really cold season with no production until March, and then it warmed up real suddenly. And toward the end of March, we were getting days that were in the 70s with a lot of sunshine. And the bacterial and yeast growth in the tubing systems just went through the roof really fast. And I suspect that having those little sanitation points all through the tubing uh, in the form of our T fittings, so the sap is passing through those T's that have antimicrobial properties, that it was actually sanitizing the sap somewhat as it came through the system. And that conferred some benefit beyond just new tubing. But in this test, in one year at least, 3 16th antimicrobial plastics did very well. And that's what it looks like in the woods. Moving up to the quarter inch antimicrobial tea, we see that it did even better for a very similar cost. Uh, same reason that it probably sanitized the tubing or sanitized the sap a little bit and conferred some additional benefit beyond all new. 
And we had a really good return on that, 71% more SAP than the older control. So doing pretty well. And that's what it looked like in the woods. The non-antimicrobial tea, so the quarter inch larger aperture without that antimicrobial plastic was an abysmal failure. It did not do well. So it would appear that having that larger aperture isn't enough to prevent that biofilm from building up to the level where it blocks the tea in year two. So that, that was not a winning strategy. And that's what it looked like in the woods. And you can see the other problems with this. If you look at the, the drop line, which is coming out of the bottom here in this case, because it's untapped, it's not seated over both the barbs very well. You really need to use the flex style tubing, which is the, the darker blue above, to get it on the barbs very well in the fittings. Uh, this rigid tubing that was used for this drop line did not work well. But even with the flex tubing, it's hard to get that fitting over the barbs and get a nice tight seal that will prevent vacuum leaks or sap leaks from the system. A major problem with the antimicrobial plastics is they are not currently eligible for organic certification. A lot of maple producers are organic certified, especially the bigger ones, because they get a 10 cent per pound premium or thereabouts for the syrup for being organic certified. And so that's not going to work for an organic operation at this point. Although we are working, uh, the Cornell Maple Program is a mediator between the manufacturers of these, these fittings and the organic certifiers to try to figure out a path forward to figure out what exactly um, is taking them out of compliance. And it appears that some of the carrier plastics that are used are not, um, don't qualify for organic certification. So they're working on some alternatives there. But for now, an alternative that you could utilize is just putting in all new teas every year or using an organic compliance certifier or sanitizer. One sanitizer that is organic compliant is the bleach, including the calcium bleach. So if you're organic certified, you can use this. And um, if you are interested in organic certification, definitely take the word of your certifying agency over mine. I am not closely involved with organic certification, but my understanding is that bleach is an acceptable sanitizer for most certifiers. So this is just a picture of the, the type of bleach I use. This was ordered over Amazon. I think it was $10 for this package that could treat as much as maybe 10 or 20,000 gallons in a swimming pool. So I didn't need very much of it to create my 400 and 600 parts per million solutions. I just used the directions that were on the label to mix up those concentrations. I put it in a backpack sprayer and I attached a piece of 5 16 inch tubing to the trigger for the spray so that I could pull the spouts and put the spout from the tubing right into that um, little piece of 5 16 tubing on my sprayer and just pull the trigger and it would inject the sanitizer into the line. And the way I did this was I unplugged the spout at the far end, the very end of my 3 16 line and let it dangle. And then I went to the bottom of that line and unplugged that spout. And that's where I injected the bleach was from the bottom of the line. So I pumped it up the line until I saw bleach flowing out the end of the line. Then I unhooked my sprayer and plugged the spouts back into their cups or their teas. And I let that sit. Uh, because of a lot of logistical complications around COVID, I didn't get to do this until the day we tapped. So I installed this treatment in the morning and then we came out and we drained the bleach and tapped that afternoon. So there wasn't a lot of contact time. It was in pretty cold conditions. It was below freezing. And I think that impacted my result because I once again didn't get as good as I expected. I did with the 400 parts per million treatments get a little better than new probably within the margin of error, which I didn't calculate for this study. Um, and same for the 600 parts per million, probably within the margin of error for the study, about as good as new, but not quite. I think that has to do with just contact time. So in other words, bleach does work. It is a viable alternative. It is just a little cumbersome because walking around in the woods with a backpack sprayer isn't easy. You can get around that by pumping bleach sanitizer up through your lines from the sugar house. Um, so that can work as well. But that, that 
involves a little bit of effort and a larger volume of sanitizer. And you have to go out and unplug each tee sometimes to let it flow through to get good contact time. But that is possible to do that. And there are a lot of producers that use 316th that are now switching to some type of system where they either inject bleach or pump it through their system during the season. Now, the last thing I should mention is that in Canada, isopropyl alcohol is a legal uh, sanitizer that can be used in their sap collection systems. And they routinely, most operators in Quebec and uh, Ontario, inject isopropyl alcohol into their systems when they untap at the end of the season and then close off their system. And that sanitizer just evaporates and recondenses all throughout the system all summer long. And they get pretty good sanitation through their whole system using that method, but it's not legal in the United States. Um, insecticides or sanitizers of any kind in the US have to go through certification with the EPA and it's an expensive process. And there's just simply not enough maple producers in the US to justify the cost to uh, isopropyl alcohol manufacturers to go through the certification. So that's not an option right now. And that's not without drawbacks. And that's just a general sanitation thing that I'd like to mention here is our strategy that I've been talking about here is to keep tap holes productive. But when you're talking about sanitizing the system more broadly to try to preserve sap quality, that can actually cause problems. And the reason for that is maple flavor, the generation of maple flavor takes place in the evaporator when you cook sap. And it relies on a process called caramelization. Caramelization is a heat process that changes flavor that relates to sugars. Caramelization happens much more readily with simple sugars like fru fructose and glucose. For sucrose, that happens at a much higher temperature. Maple sap is 100% sucrose sugar when it comes out of the tree. But the microbes in the tubing collection system break that down into fructose and glucose. If you eliminate all the microbes from your system by doing something like, something like injecting isopropyl alcohol and 100% sanitizing it, you end up with not enough microbes to break down some of the sugars and you don't get caramelization in the evaporator. That leads to really light syrup with really delicate flavor or no flavor. And what we found is the modern trend for consumers is they much prefer those darker, more robust maple flavors. So if you're sanitizing your whole system too extensively, you're going to get syrup that no one wants to buy. And for that reason, we focus more on simply maintaining productivity than we do on trying to sanitize the entire system. So those are the results from the 3 16th tubing. I hope that made sense. I'm gonna jump over to the chat box and answer some questions. Um, let me just make sure I get all the questions here. Zooming down, I see, okay. I see Steve's comments. So Steve Gabriel is saying they, Aaron, we have some 3 16th laterals. We installed with 5 16th inch drops. So the T is a 5 16th by 3 16th by 3 16th. Going to replace the drops next year anyway. So should we replace the T's? Seems like 3 16th antimicrobial and 3 16th inch drop with check valve would be a good idea. How long would those T's last? Um, other alternatives seem to be replacing the T's every year, but that's a lot of work. Yeah, so in that situation, so Steve and his sugar bush is going to replace his drop lines, but that won't resolve the clogged T issue. So if he simply cuts off the drop lines and replaces those, he's still going to have diminished production due to the clogging in the T's. So yes, Steve, in that case, you would have to either replace your T's or do a bleach sanitation in that system to maintain productivity. Um, otherwise, you're just going to run into the same problem. The antimicrobial teas right now, um, we've only done two years of research on those, so I'm not in the position to strongly make a recommendation. I don't really make recommendations anyway. I, I would just say that the data isn't extensive enough to support that yet, although it looks promising at this point. Uh, what I think is a potential path forward and is likely to happen is that um, 
over time, maple equipment dealers are going to start manufacturing more of these antimicrobial fittings. And I hear rumor of that right now. So hopefully we'll have some antimicrobial 3 16 inch tees with a 5 16 inch drop line sometime in the near future. If not this coming season, then I suspect we'll see it the next season. So yeah, that's a, a good point. There really needs to be more done than just replacing the drop line on, on 3 16 inch tubing. So I'm going to change gears a little bit and just share a couple other quick things here. Um, let's see if I can get my slide to advance. One question I get a lot is, when should I tap my trees? And this is a real balancing act because even with tap hole longevity treatments, even if we do everything possible to keep those tap holes productive as long as possible, they still have a limited lifespan. In the past, when we didn't do these tap hole sanitation treatments, we could expect about six weeks, six weeks of good production from our tap holes. With these tap hole sanitation treatments, we can get a longer, um, a longer life out of our tap hole, sometimes two or three months, sometimes more. But it's still a balancing act because what we're trying to do is have that productive time period, that lifespan of the tap hole overlap with the most sap runs as possible, the most productive part of the sugaring season as possible. And this is complicated now because in the past, you know, as I said, I've been making maple syrup since I was a kid in the seventies and the weather patterns seemed pretty reliable in the past. We typically just looked at the calendar when we decided when to tap, we'd go out in mid February, right around Valentine's day, we'd tap our trees and we'd expect to make syrup through the end of March, maybe a little bit at the beginning of the April, and that was the sugaring season. And then we were done. It was pretty reliable. What we find now is that there's a lot of variation in climate. And we've all seen this, right? There are plenty of days in the middle of winter where it's warm. There are a lot of freeze thaw cycles in January, sometimes December. So that complicates the equation a little bit about when do I tap my trees? In some ways, it also creates opportunity, at least from my perspective, because it creates a broader window of time when we can collect sap. In order to inform maple producers with some better tools and some better guidance, we're taking another look in this new climate that we're experiencing at sap production within the tree. So, by we, I mean my colleague Adam Wild and I, we got some grant funding to test the total dormant season productive potential of trees. And what, the questions we try to answer with this are, what is the total productive output of a tree during the entire dormant season? So from leaf off till bud swell, so October to April roughly, how much sugar can a maple tree actually produce during that time? If we collected all that sap, the second question is, is that sustainable? What's the impact on the tree? Because we're taking a larger quantity of sap and we're also wounding the tree more to collect that. And I'll show you why that's true in a moment. And lastly, we wanna see, are there some trends that we were missing in the past regarding sap flow timing? And our experimental design here, I'm sorry, there are a lot of words on this page. Basically, it's the same design as I showed you before with canisters that collect the sap. Uh, the difference is here is we tap these trees as soon as the leaves are falling off the trees. So I tapped this year on October 22nd. And last year, and those the results I'm going to show you are from last year, I tapped on October 28th. We collect the sap from each sap rung. We me measure the volume of the sugar content. And anytime the tap holes look like they're losing their productivity due to the tree closing off the wound or, or bacterial contamination or what have you, as soon as we notice a drop in production, we put a new tap hole in that tree, we plug the old one, and now we've got a fresh tap hole to keep collecting sap from. And the last part of the experimental design is that we have five trees at each forest, so five in Lake Placid and five at the Arnott Forest near Ithaca, that will cut down at the end of this three-year study. And we will section that wood and look at how much uh, non-conductive or wounded wood we have formed within the tree. 
And if we're forming wounded wood faster than the tree is growing new wood, then it's not a sustainable practice. And over the long term, we'll run out of places where we can tap that tree where we can get sap. So this is just a, another picture of the experiment. I keep my canisters for this experiment indoors so that they don't freeze. Just makes it a little easier to measure sap sugar content, but they're hooked to a, a high vacuum system. My system runs at about 26 inches of vacuum, and I think Adam's runs at about the same. And the picture on the right is showing a tree where I tapped it in October last year, and you can see the sap flowing through the tubing. One important thing to note from this study is that in this picture on the right, there were no freeze thaw cycles before I tapped this tree, and yet there is sap flowing. And this year I tapped October 22nd, and there were no frost. There hadn't been a single freeze yet during the season, and there weren't any until October 28th. But between October 22nd and October 28th, I collected a massive volume of sap. Now, why is that true? I showed you before that freeze thaws were necessary to create pressure in the tree to create sap flow. However, if you have a vacuum system, you can essentially suck the sap right up through the tree. So it's sucking water from the soil through the root membranes into the tree and into your collection canister. So with high vacuum, you can actually collect sap when there's no freeze thaw cycles. Just an important side note. And this is how the trees looked at the end of the season last year. I tapped my trees three times last year. And you can see the old spouts or the white things stuck in the tree where I, I put a little rubber cap on the end of them and just plug those trees off. So three taps last season and I, I lined them up vertically so that the, the partitioned or wounded wood columns that form around those wounds would be lined up with each other and just make one row of wounded wood instead of creating a, a scattershot pattern of wounded wood all over the tree. How did we do for yield last year? In this graph on the bottom, on the x-axis, we're starting at November 1st, and then we're running through the end of April, or the beginning of April. And you can see these are running totals from each of my four treatments. And for some reason, my color coding didn't match my naming scheme at the top, so I apologize for that. But what you can see is that on the left-hand side here, our y-axis is showing the equivalent of gallons of syrup per tap that I got a half gallon of syrup from those taps before the end of the year. So before the traditional sugaring season had even started, I had harvested about a half gallon of, of syrup from those trees. Now, if you're familiar with syrup yields on average, um, most sugaring operations are averaging about 0.3 gallons per tap in a typical season. So this is above the typical average, in just half of the period where I'm collecting sap. Then there was a long cold period in January and February where there was virtually no sap produced. And then between March 1st and the end of March, I made another, roughly another half gallon of syrup per tap. So these trees yielded about a gallon of syrup per tap over the total dormant season. And compare that with a typical, typical sugaring operation where they're getting about 0.3 gallons per tap. The caveat here is this is a research system. It's maintained at a higher level. So this isn't a realistic yield to expect in a more commercial situation. So that's to be taken with a grain of salt. And I compared these with my other treatments in the woods. It's not a direct line comparison to a typical sugaring operation, but it is pretty revealing. That is a significant amount of sap and it's a pretty high yield. And the other thing to note from this is that the sugar content in the sap is highly variable, but typically quite a bit lower during the fall season. Trees store their energy reserves as starches in their, their ray cells, and they convert it back into sugars with an enzyme called amylase that they release um, in increasing amounts as you get closer to spring. So when you're in the fall, the tree's really not producing a lot of amylase and not converting a lot of those starches into sugars. So it's not atypical to see sugar contents below 1% in the fall. Right now, when I checked my trees yesterday, they were at 0.3%. The implication there is if you're a maple producer and you wanted to tap your trees in the fall, you would have to extract a lot more water to produce your syrup. 
If you're using some of the modern technologies like reverse osmosis, that's not a big deal. But if you're boiling your sap to make syrup, this might be a deal breaker for you, right? That's a lot of extra work to create your syrup if you have half or less than half the amount of sugar content. Whereas in the spring, you're typically closer to 2% for sugar. And that's a, a pretty common number that people experience in their sugar bushes. So that's what we found so far. The really important thing to take away from this study is that it's just research. I'm not recommending for people to retap their trees in this way. What we're trying to do is gain some understanding about what is possible or how we can adapt with different tap timing to a changing climate. So that's one strategy we're looking at. And I think it'll be exciting to see how this unfolds both between multiple seasons and also over multiple locations. We're replicating this study at our Lake Placid research station in the Adirondacks, and that's more representative of a typical cold climate condition. It's much colder in Lake Placid than it is at the Arnott Forest near Ithaca. So he's got different conditions. And so far in our first year of data last season, uh, the yields were much lower in the fall in that colder climate. And folks that have studied this in Vermont have found a similar thing that fall tapping does seem to have less yield in those colder climates. But it's something we're gonna keep looking at and maybe we'll have some revised recommendations on how we tap our trees over the long run. Um, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. I would hope to talk a little bit about some of the new products we're innovating at Cornell. I'm running low on time and I wanna leave time for questions, but I'll quickly mention that we're doing a lot of research into new product development at Cornell. The trends in consumers right now are strongly toward natural, sustainable, um, locally produced ingredients in their foods. Maple syrup checks all those boxes. Consumers are increasingly aware that their high fructose corn syrup and cane sugar and things like that are grown in monocultures that require intensive cultivation. Those have a lot of negative environmental externalities. So there's runoff from those fields. They don't have a lot of habitat for wildlife in those types of fields. And then when those crops are harvested, they go through a really intensive refinement process. If you look at a high fructose corn syrup factory, it looks like an oil refinery and it requires a lot of energy to convert the raw material into a highly refined sugar. Compare that with a maple sugaring operation where we walk into the forest and install our tubing and the forest remains completely intact. We don't disturb its ecosystem function or its habitat value whatsoever. And yet we can harvest a product that we make into a sugar. So consumers, when they compare those two sweeteners are much more interested in a natural sweetener like maple that's more sustainable than something like high fructose corn syrup. So that's driving a lot of demand for maple and we're trying to capitalize on that trend by innovating new products that maple can be used in. Right now, most people think of maple as something that's made into syrup, but really we're not maple syrup producers necessarily when we go out and tap trees. We're sap farmers, we're collecting sap, and we can take that sap and make a wide range of products, including maple syrup, but also a wide range of other things. If we look at the maple pro or the maple syrup market right now, people buy about, or, or we sell in the US, domestically made syrup, we sell about $100 million of syrup every year. In New York State, we sell about $30 million every year of domestically produced maple syrup. Compare that to something like the New York State wine industry. They're generating $5 billion of economic activity every year. People spend a lot more money on alcohol than they do on maple syrup for their pancakes. If we look at maple syrup, it's a sugar. It's a perfectly fermentable sugar. So it can serve as a fermentation substrate to make alcohols. And we've looked at that and that's not a 100% new concept. People are making maple beer and maple wine. They've been doing it for years, but there aren't really good guidelines for making high quality maple wine or maple beer that's out there. So we've tapped into all the resources we have at Cornell through the Food Venture Center through our enology and viticulture program and worked with all those researchers to develop guidelines to make a high-end maple wine that can appeal to a broad range of audiences and can capture a premium in the marketplace. If you go to cornellmaple.com and look at our new products development tab, 
you'll find a guidebook with instructions on how to make good quality maple wine and the sample batches that we've produced and shared with uh, winemaking experts have led them to believe that as a dessert wine, it could potentially be a 30 to $40 per bottle type of wine. So there's a lot of opportunities out there, maple chocolate, maple marshmallows, kombucha, sports supplements, sports gels. We're working on all that. And all that is being published at our new product development tab at cornellmaple.com. So go ahead and check that out if you're interested in diversification in that way. So I've talked at you for a long period of time. I'd really like to open the floor for questions for the last 10 minutes. Feel free to unmute your mic or enter a question in the chat box. If I've held you up long enough, you feel, feel free to take off at this point, but I'm happy to hang out as long as folks want to stick around to answer questions. <laughs> 